Good morning and thank you for joining us today for our live immigration webinar on the topic of Are You Brexit Ready? Let me firstly introduce myself. I am Imelda Reddington and I am Head of Immigration at Field Seymour Parks. I joined the firm in 2019 to head up a new immigration practice area for immigration. I have worked in the field of immigration for almost 12 years and I have seen many changes during that time. Now Field Seymour Parks is a full service law firm based in the centre of Reading. We have over 100 staff and we service clients from all over the UK, but many of our regular clients are based in the Thames Valley Corridor. We at FSP offered a tailored approach to our clients, primarily offering practical legal advice. We also offer free seminars, webinars and podcasts at regular intervals throughout the year. And we offer bespoke training and workshops for complicated processes in the immigration arena, such as right to work compliance, sponsor license compliance and finally we offer an administration service to assist registered registered sponsors managing their sponsor license and their duties for their migrant workers and let me take you through the agenda with some housekeeping um, i will be the sole speaker today and i will talk to you about some of the preparations businesses and individuals can undertake before our eminent brexit departure which is now in mere three and a half months away uh, the webinar will run, run for one hour and 15 minutes. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with various platforms for webinars during these times, but I'll briefly explain the format for this particular webinar. I would have slides on the screen with my image alongside. Now, I believe you can change the format depending on whether you choose a desktop or mobile device. You will be muted throughout the webinar. There is a question area where you can write your questions throughout the webinar. So at the end, I will leave about 15 minutes to answer, answer your questions. Now, my apologies if I don't get time to answer them all, but I will send you a response later if I don't get to it today. There will be some interaction throughout the hour. We have four polls, so I would really appreciate it if you could participate, please. And the webinar will be recorded and the slides are available for you to download in the handout section which is within the webinar. So please feel free to download the uh, slides to take them away with you. And finally, at the end, there will be a very short survey. I believe it's about four questions. So I would appreciate please if you could spare a minute to answer the questions as this will help us with the preparation of future events and topics. So today, we're really going to look at the considerations for employers under five key, key areas. <clears throat> These are areas that you as employers would need to consider looking at ahead of Brexit. The first one is to look at your workforce and uh, to see if you employ EU nationals to identify whether they're in key roles. Um, the second consideration is to look at where you source your talent from. Do you recruit from overseas, including Europe? Um, how will you source that talent from next year? If you do recruit from overseas, um, particularly EU nationals, they will be subject to the, the UK immigration system from next January. And we have the introduction of a new system, which I will look at a little bit later and look at the routes that are available to you moving forward. Our next consideration is for right to work. How can employers ensure they're compliant with right to work legislations if they have to incorporate EU nationals from next year? And finally, we will look at what our relationship could like with the EU and what preparations businesses and individuals can be undertaken ahead of time. Now, the considerations are broken down into four, excuse me, five topics. Our first topic is in relation to the EU settlement scheme. It will be referred to as the EUSS or the scheme throughout the presentation. Our second topic will be looking at recruitment and sponsorship. Our third topic will look at the new immigration system, which comes into force on the 1st of January 2021. Our fourth topic is to look at the right to work checks. And I'm going to spend a couple of minutes to look at those that those checks that have been revised for COVID, um, because I would just like to highlight to employers um, that could be affected by this new process. And final topic is the future relationship with preparations for businesses and individuals. Now, before we move on to our first topic, 
I would love for you to participate in our first poll. So how many European nationals are residing in the UK? Is it 1 million, 3.7 million, 10 million, 20 million, or 1 billion? I will give you a few moments to answer. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for your participation. 2% um, two, two have selected 1 million, 62% have selected 3.7 million, 24% have selected 10 million, 10% uh, at 20 million, and 2% at 1 billion. So we have a good variation. However, the largest uh, percentage has selected the figure which is closest to what we anticipate is residing in the UK. Um, now the 3.7 million comes from a public record in 2019. However, interestingly, the Home Office reported um, just last week that 3.8 million applications had been received um, to register under the EU European Settlement Scheme. <clears throat> so I expect that um, the number could be in excess of 3.8 million. So there is still some way to go with those who do need to register under the scheme before um, the uh, deadline, which is uh, next year. Now, to start off, what is the European Settlement Scheme? Um, well, it's a body of legislation that replaces the EEA regulations, or what we know as European law, but it sits in our UK national law. The European, the EEA re regulations will continue to operate until the end of the transition, which is the 31st of December 2020. However, the EUSS will run alongside until the end of transition and the end of the period for registration, which is um, the end of June next year. The scheme is open to EEA nationals, Swiss nationals and the family members to apply either in the UK or overseas. Now, applying to the scheme is a very simple online process, which is accessed through an app. Using the app, the applicant must scan their face, take a photograph, provide their national insurance number and declare any criminal convictions before they can submit an application. The application in some cases can be instant or in others it can take up to five working days. Now I have heard that some applications which are more complicated can take a little bit longer and these can um, exceed 30 days. But it's a point to note that European nationals who want to stay in the UK after the transition period, they must reg register under the scheme. Another point to note here is that for European nationals who are already in the UK with a status under EU law, so they could hold a registration certificate or a permanent residence card, they must also apply to switch their status to the scheme. And it's a matter of just switching. So in terms of eligibility and status, it's open to all European Swiss nationals and their family members, and the scheme will remain open until the 30th of June, 2021. Only applicants who are in the UK at 11 p.m. on the 31st of December, 2020 can apply to the scheme. And all European nationals, including those who have registered under the European law must register if they were to have a status to remain and reside in the UK after the 30th of June, 2021. Family members can join those European nationals after the 31st of, of, excuse me, of December, provided they can demonstrate their relationship existed before the end of the transition. If successful, the applicants will receive a status called settle status, which means you have provided evidence to demonstrate you have resided in the UK for five years, or they will receive a status called pre-settle status, which means they have been in the UK for less than five years. Now, there's no time limit on, on how you can achieve pre-settled status. You just need to demonstrate your residence in the UK at the time. Mm -hmm. 
So what can employers do to prepare themselves if they are employing EU nationals? Uh, well, we expect that most European nationals who want to remain in the UK will have already registered. And we saw from the poll that 3.8 million had already registered under the scheme. However, we do know there are some that are reluctant to do so for many different reasons. So as employers, you should really be assessing your workforce in preparation for our exit. So the first thing you need to do is identify who your European nationals are, get to know them, get to know what roles they're in, are they key workers, do they hold key skills in their organisation, would your business survive if they were to leave you unexpectedly, if they don't want to stay in the UK. Have they already registered? Now, there is no obligation for EU nationals to provide their status to, to their employers and employers cannot ask for their status. But if they've shared the information with you, then you can record it against their file and it will save you a little bit of time later establishing whether they can remain in the UK beyond the end of the registration period. If you haven't tackled any communication, <clears throat> excuse me, with your employees, there's a terrific toolkit, which is a great resource on the .gov website. And it, it has, um, Numerous resources, including communication, which you can use for your employees. It has um, a number of banners, um, posters, diagrams, um, easy guides to assist your employees with the registration under the, under the scheme. So if, if you haven't done anything now, um, access this resource and it will assist you with um, all kinds of communication and to assist you um, get your employees registered ahead of time. And finally, employers, you need to identify if you have any new or potential vacancies. Um, the access to the European market will no longer be from the 1st of January. Again, if you have European nationals who are not sure whether they want to stay with you, you need to, as a business, establish whether these um, vacancies can be filled from the UK, if you have a gap in skills, and what you can do to fill these vacancies. Um, ahead of uh, the transition or at the start of next year. So the important thing is really to start preparing. Now this moves me to my next topic, which is uh, recruitment and sponsorship. In this topic, we cover mainly recruitment of staff from overseas. Um, organizations who want to sponsor migrants from overseas, including Europe, will require a sponsor license. Now, for those of you who have never recruited from overseas but relied on Europe for their staff, they must now register for a license with the Home Office in order to continue relying on Europe as a source for your skills. There are some factors to consider, primarily the cost. Um, there are additional fees associated with sponsoring migrants. And these can be considerable, and these you would need to factor into your recruitment plans for next year. Just as an example, a skilled worker visa will cost a medium or a large company £3,199 in a skills charge for a three-year visa. Now, this doesn't include legal fees or the visa fees for the applicant or the healthcare surcharge, which is going to increase to a staggering £624 from October. These all have to be factored into both the employer costs and the employee costs. So in terms of how, what is a sponsor license? So sponsor registration covers many types of organizations, including UK and international registered businesses, charities, religious institutions, sports organizations, and educational establishments. The type of license you obtain depends on why your business wants to sponsor migrants. Today, the focus of my presentation will be on employers, but we do advise other organizations um, so please get in touch if you do not fit into the employer category. Now, the Home Office deemed the sponsor license to be a privilege and one that they will only grant after careful consideration of an application, assessment of the business operation and demonstration of evidence to show you are a lawful operation. Being granted a license will require the organisation to take on immigration control and responsibility for hiring migrants for their day to day activities. The organization is also required to report any changes to the organization's structure ownership within very tight and strict reporting timelines. So if you want to apply for a sponsor license, 
you must firstly meet the eligibility and suitability criteria. You need to consider factors such as, has the organization ever had a previous license? Have they, have they ever had a refusal? Have they ever had any prior immigration offenses? This also includes individuals who will be the key personnel who you, who you assign to the license. The next step of applying for a license is to look at your lawful trading presence in the UK. Your presence can be demonstrated through um, providing key documents to the Home Office. So these key documents would demonstrate um, your PAYE registration, your VAT registration, evidence of a corporate bank statement with um, corporate transactions and regular transactions, um, proof of ownership of a lease of the business premises, so combining these documents, um, you've presented these as evidence of your lawful presence so that the Home Office can consider an application. In addition to your presence, the Home Office would consider whether you are capable as an organization of managing and controlling your migrant workforce. They would look at your recruitment practice, practices and processes, ensuring these are robust, ensuring these can monitor information in relation to migrants' whereabouts, holidays, absences, ensuring that if the migrants breach um, any of the duties associated with sponsorship, that you would be able to utilize disciplinary procedures and practices against them for failure to comply. You would need to nominate key personnel there are three roles you need to nominate. You have an authorizing officer who is the most senior person in the organization and is ultimately responsible for the monitoring and control of your migrant workforce. Any <clears throat> penalties that need to be imposed or any offenses would normally be um, towards the authorizing officer as ultimately it is their responsibility to ensure they know exactly who your migrant workforce is and who has access to your sponsor license. In addition to an authorizing officer, you will have a key contact and a level one user. Now, representatives can take on the role of key contact and it will be their responsibility then to share information with the sponsor and the associated users as to changes that impact their license and sponsorship duties generally. And we, um, as a representative, can take on this role for you. Um, a level one user, it's really important that the level one user has access to the, to the um, Home Office portal. Um, they're responsible for all the day-to-day -day management of the license. And it's important that um, they have access at all times, quite often, employers tell me we have a license and that person who is assigned a level one user has left the organization. So it's important that if you are assigning a level one user and um, it's noted in their file and that position is handed over to someone else if they are due to leave the organization. It is a breach of duties if you fail to have access to the sponsor management system. Now, one individual can take on three role, all three roles, but obviously if you're assigning the senior position to your authorizing officer, they may not have the capacity or resource to access the system on a day-to-day -day basis. So perhaps you do need to consider having a level one user who's um, perhaps in a, in a lower level role. So um, once you have uh, assessed whether you meet all the suitability requirements and nominate key personnel, you make an online application. It's a fairly straightforward application. Um, you can access the application, return to it later if you don't have the information to hand. Um, one key point here is a representative, a legal representative can assist you in preparation of your application, but they cannot submit the application for you. The nominated authorizing officer must submit the application as there are a number of declarations contained within the submission that they must agree to at the time of submission. So if a representative is found to submit an application on behalf of a, a sponsor, the application could be rejected. If the application is rejected, there is a cooling off period of six months before you can reapply. And unfortunately, this is a six month delay to your potential recruitment process. And if you're looking to employ someone, that delay is not going to assist your business. So be careful that you are aware of the process before you undertake it. And the final two stages in applying for a license is to pay the fee online. Um, and note the fee is related to the size of your business. 
So you have a small or charity and a medium and large, just make sure you are paying the appropriate fee before you submit, because again, your license can be rejected if you pay the inappropriate fee. And the final stage of applying for a license is to wait, either for the application to be considered or for the Home Office to decide they want to pay you a visit. Um, now, before lockdown, the Home Office announced that they like to visit approximately 40% of new applicants. However, during lockdown and COVID measures have suspended all compliance visits. Although I am hearing, not from my clients, but from other clients, that they are, their applications are on hold pending a compliance visit. Um, we expect these to be resumed. Um, we were expecting these to be resumed at the end of this month, but given the announcement due to come at 12.30 today, I'm not quite sure that will be the case. However, if the Home Office wants to pay a visit to your organisation to assess whether you're a suitable candidate for obtaining a licence, they will delay your application pending a visit and the outcome of that visit. So that's applying for a licence. Um, so from once you have your licence, you then need to, need to maintain it. Um, now, maintaining a licence is it's quite um, a time consuming process. Um, you do need to dedicate some resources to it at the outset. Um, you need to maintain and update documents for migrants and your organization. Um, there is a rather large appendix guidance document indicating how many documents you need to maintain and update on a regular basis. So it's worth knowing this um, on the grant of your license. You need to report changes as they occur in terms of the migrant and the organization. Um, now, I indicated earlier there are some very strict reporting timelines, some as little as 10 days. So you need to ensure that you are aware of what's happening with your migrants and across the organization. And if these changes are necessary to be reported, they're reported in a timely fashion. You need to record absences for your sponsored workers. So you need to know when they're on holiday, when they're sick, um, and make sure it's recorded in a central uh, calendar. Uh, you need to report any key changes to key personnel. So I gave an example a few moments ago of a level one user leaving the organization and not being replaced. So the sponsor didn't have access to their license. It's equally important to report changes if your authorizing officer leaves the organization. You need to maintain a user with access to the sponsor management system. So this would be a level one or level two user. Um, you need to record and um, maintain visa start and expiry dates for all your migrant workers. And I recommend that these are in a shared calendar with um, reminders at uh, various increments. So one month, two months, three months uh, ahead of the expiry date so that somebody is taking action to ensure that that migrant has their visa renewed before its expiry date. And the last point is know your sponsor duties. Um, there are many that um, some may not be aware of, but failure to adhere to your sponsor duties could result in the suspension or revocation of your license. If your license is suspended, uh, sponsors often have to engage lawyers to prepare pages of representations to support their case, to conduct audits, to ensure compliance with all aspects of the sponsorship scheme before trying to have the license reinstated. And oftentimes um, the Home Office will consider various other action plans to ensure that the sponsor is maintaining duties and they will be checked on a regular basis before permanent reinstation. If a license is suspended, you cannot assign any new certificates to your migrants, so it prevents you from taking on any new migrants. If your license is revoked, there is a potential for your migrants leave to be curtailed unless they find another job in the UK or they, they, um, they move to another sponsor. Um, if your license is revoked, your migrants will be uh, served with a curtailment notice. Um, and the only way to appeal a revocation is through judicial review, which is a very expensive process through the High Court. And I know from experience that very, very few revocations are reinstated. So we at FSP have a sponsor license administration service whereby we act, we sit as representative and level one user on your license. 
we record um, migrant information start and expiries of visa and we'll notify you at relevant intervals um, so that you um, report this information to your migrant and they can prepare a renewal ahead of their expiry. We also report key information in terms of duties and remind you what your duties are throughout the period of your license, which is four years. So we are here to help you if you do have a license because it does seem a bit of a daunting task at the outset. Right, well, that, that's, that's all I have to say on, on a sponsor license. I'm going to move on to topic um, three, which is the new immigration system. Now, I'm sure you've all heard about the new immigration system. It's been um, promoted since we first voted to leave the European Union. Now, we all are already seeing some signs of uh, streamlining and simplifying the immigration rules. The immigration rules have been criticized for years um, but we do hope that this new system will be um, much simpler to understand and navigate. Um, we did see um, some streamlining and simplification of those rules just last week when we saw the introduction of a new student route, which, happy to say, has 40% less words than the current rules. So we do hope this is a sign of things to come. So what does the new immigration system look like? Well, it'll come into operation on the 1st of January uh, 2021, um, but we are told that you will be able to, for new sponsors in particular, you will be able to apply for a new type license from the autumn 2020. Um, that hasn't happened just yet, but we hope it'll, we'll hear something in the, in the coming weeks about that um, license system uh, coming into operation. Um, for those of you who have an existing license, um, under the, any, of the, any of the schemes, the Tier 2 scheme, Tier 4 scheme, Tier 5 scheme, once your license is available for renewal, you will automatically move to the new um, sponsor license scheme. So if you're eligible to employ Tier 2 workers under the general scheme, you will then be able to employ workers under the skilled worker scheme. So the new visa routes I'm going to look at today these are made, some of these are sponsored and some of these are non-sponsored but I, again I will look in a little bit detail later on. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the routes I will look at, um, skilled worker route which replaces the tier 2 general route, the intercompany route uh, replacing the tier 2 ICT route, the health care visa which sits under the skilled worker route, um, global talent, uh, graduates route, uh, students route, a highly skilled workers route and there is a low skilled workers route although this is under a current sponsorship scheme and is only available to certain agricultural workers. So the one that really affects um, most of you I anticipate is the sponsored route for the skilled worker. Um, as I said it replaces the tier 2 general route so a migrant would still be required to have a job offer from a licensed sponsor. So obviously from next year, if you, if you do find a migrant you want to employ, um, you must be registered as a sponsor in order to utilise this visa route. Um, a welcome note is the reduction of the skill level. The current Tier 2 general route has a skill level of RQF6 or a degree level role. This has now been reduced to a, a RQF3, which is equivalent to an A level role. The English language will continue to be required. Um, there is a reduction in the salary level. Uh, the salary level required is now going to be a minimum of 25,600, where currently it is at 30,000 or there is a further reduction for certain roles, so shortage occupation, certain NHS roles and education roles for a salary of 20,480. And they will maintain the new entrant rate, which is 80% of those salaries. The new entrant rate, for those of you who aren't aware of it, is for those who are 26 and under or graduates at the time of their application, and they're applying for a visa, which is for no more than three years. Now, the new immigration system introduces a points-based system so for the skilled worker a migrant would need to demonstrate he has obtained 70 points to be eligible for the skilled worker visa of those points 50 are mandatory and 20 are tradable now by mandatory they mean that you must have a job offer which will give 20 points the skill of the role must be a minimum of rqf3 or a level equivalent 
to give a further 20 points and English at an suitable uh, level, which is actually a B1 to give the 10 points. Those points combined make up the 50 mandatory points. Now in the tradable points, which are, is a further 20 points, they can be made up of a maximum of 20 points for the type of role and a maximum of 20 points for the salary. And that would make up your 70 points in total. So the biggest change really to the um, sponsored worker or the skilled worker route is there's no resident labour market test. And I think I failed to mention that in my previous slide, which is a really welcome change for those who found a migrant who they wanted to offer a role to and then discovered they had to meet this resident labour market test, which extended the recruitment period by about four weeks. So no resident labour market test, a reduction in skills and a reduction in salary. Now, the intention really overall was to reduce the skill level, so it would compensate really on not having access to the European market. So we'll watch this space and see how we progress next year. Now, the next uh, sponsorship visa I'm going to look at is the intercompany transfer visa. This replaces the tier two ICT route. Um, the, the criteria is very, very similar. Um, international organizations may transfer staff who are highly skilled, provided they have 12 months service into the UK branch. Um, now I'll make a note here because currently, for those of you who are familiar with the scheme, that 12 month service is not required if the employee is earning a salary in excess of 73 odd thousand pounds. There is nothing in the rules, the new rules yet or the guidance to say whether this will transpose into the new intercompany route. Um, so we don't quite know if that will still apply moving into the new system, but it will currently apply until the end of December. There is also an opportunity for graduates who have three months service to transfer into a UK uh, branch of the organization. Um, a very welcome change under the ICT route is the cooling off period is relaxed. Currently, once a migrant has uh, fulfilled the period of time in his visa, they must return to their um, international branch and remain for 12 months, which was the cooling off period. This has been relaxed so that an intercompany visa will permit five years in any six year period. Now, again, we're not quite sure how this will be enforced or what specific rules uh, we will have or requirements are in relation to this point. Um, so we will probably receive more guidance in due course. However, another very interesting point is from the 1st of January, um, holders of an ICT visa can switch into the skilled worker route. And this is without having to leave the UK. Um, so I know this would be a very welcome change for many organisations who have transferred key workers into the UK. They've been here five years or nine years for those who are paid in excess of £120,000. Um, and then at the end of five or nine years, they must leave the UK because they cannot switch to another route. They've um, fulfilled the permitted time in the route. So it's very welcome now that those um, individuals will be able to switch into the skilled worker route. Um, and we don't quite know, again, the specific requirements in relation to skills, how, how to switch, uh, what the requirements will be, but we do expect some further guidance to be issued ahead of the 1st of January. Uh, the skill level will remain the same, which is a degree level, and there is no requirement to have uh, an English language um, level to meet the, the requirements of this route. And the salary will also remain at uh, 41,500. Um, there is a lower salary for graduate trainees, however, that hasn't been reported um, from what I've seen. So again, we hope to have a little bit more detail on the specifics um, of the salary requirement for the graduates. So one question I, I'm, I'm asked quite a bit actually, and I'll, I'll respond here, um, in terms of those who want to switch from the tier two ICT to the um, skilled worker route, there is a question of oh, when can I settle in the UK? Um, and it does appear that those who switch to the skilled worker route would have to start their time again to be eligible for settlement, a uh, five-year period, unless, of course, they can qualify for a long residence um, settlement. Now, the next sponsored visa I'm going to look at mm -hmm. is the health and care visa. Now, this effectively sits under the skilled worker route. 
Um, so a migrant who seeks to enter the UK under this route would need a job offer um, in a specified profession for an approved service provider with a registered sponsor. Um, they must meet the 70 points that are required for the skilled worker. Um, there is, however, a huge reduction in fees for applications, um, as little as £232 compared to the 704 for a normal skilled worker visa. And there is an exemption in the healthcare surcharge, um, again, which I mentioned earlier, £624 from the 1st of October. So this is an attempt to uh, attract workers, particularly from Europe, um, into this health and care visa route, where we know that we have many, many workers um, in the NHS that we source from Europe. So this is an attempt to try and replace those skills. Now I'm going to look at the other routes. Now these are non-sponsored, so migrants entering into these routes do not need a job offer before they come to the UK. Um, the Global Talent Route, this is now open to European nationals from the 1st of January. It's for highly skilled scientists and research. Um, they do, however, require an endorsement from an approved UK body, and this can take up to three months. So those uh, European nationals who are looking to come to the UK under this route um, would need to start looking at endorsement from now. Um, we will see a highly skilled worker route. However, we don't know when it will be introduced. Um, it will be at some point next year. Um, it will mean that highly skilled workers can come to the UK without a job offer. Um, we expect it will uh, run alongside the employer-led system. And we also expect it will be capped and monitored very carefully because um, a route like this is um, there is a potential for some abuse, as we have seen in previous highly skilled worker routes, um, which were introduced in 2008-2009. Um, um, the next one that's available is the Startup Innovator, and this has been around for over a year. Um, those who want to come to the UK under this route would require a minimum investment of £50,000, and again, they would need to have an endorsement from an approved UK body. Another very welcome route is the Graduate Route, um, this used to be the old post-study worker visa. This will commence next year, not quite sure when. We think it's around summer next year. And it will allow those graduates who have just um, left universities in the UK to remain in the UK for two years post-studies, which means that they don't leave the UK um, and bring all of those skills with them. So this will be a really welcome change for employers in the UK. And finally, um, I'll just quickly look at visiting the UK, particularly for European nationals. Um, because the UK become a third country national um, from the 1st of January, European nationals who, who enter will be permitted to enter as visitors um, in the same way as third country nationals enter currently as visitors. So work is not permitted. Um, those European nationals with status under the European Settlement Scheme can enter with their ID cards. Um, they can use the automatic gates, e-gates at, at many airports, um, which saves delays um, on presenting documents to border control. And those who are under the, registered under the scheme can also use their passports close to the expiry. Uh, here in the UK, the Passport Office likes to grant passports in excess of the 10-year standard to feel like they haven't lost on time on a previous passport but those entering um, the UK those entering excuse me Europe afterwards um, would need to watch that um, and I will come again I'll come up on that point again um, in the individuals a little bit later on in my presentation but for European nationals they would be permitted to enter um, the UK even though their passports have less, less than six months expiry and in 2025 we will see a system called ETA, which um, is very similar to the ESTA program run in the US, whereby we will have a permission to travel in electronic format um, in advance of travel. But this is some way off. Um, so that, that concludes my, uh, my section on the new immigration system. And we have another poll coming up um, before we move on to our next section. So our next section is on, on right to work. 
And my question is, if an employer is found guilty of employing someone they believe did not have the right to work in the UK, what is the penalty? Is it A, five years in prison, B, £20,000 of fine, or C, none, just plead ignorance? Oh, I, we have five years in prison with 33%, £20,000 fine at 64%, and yes, 3% saying yes, none plead ignorance. Well, congratulations to those who said five years in prison, and I'll explain why. Um, the, um, if an employer is found guilty of employing someone they didn't believe has a right to work in the UK, the maximum uh, penalty is five years imprisonment. If they fail to retain or maintain the appropriate documents to show that someone has a right to work in the UK, there is a fine imposed of up to £20,000. Um, this is um, obviously the, those who have, um, are found guilty of, they would need to have some belief in the knowledge that the person didn't have a right to work. And this is why the penalty is five years imprisonment. It's strict, it's strict liability in terms of, of not being aware of your duties as an employer to maintain the appropriate documents for right to work. And therefore the fine of up to 20,000 pounds can be imposed. That's the maximum penalty for those who just forgot to undertake a follow-up check, didn't have the appropriate documents in place, um, forgot to check documents and so on. So um, it's important that anyone in your organization who undertakes a right to work check undertakes the check appropriately and records it on file appropriately. Um, the penalties imposed are substantial, um, with nearly 5 million imposed in the last reported figures from the Home Office, which was um, quarter one of 2019, and that was just for London and the South East. So um, in addition to receiving a fine for failure to conduct a proper right to work check is um, named and shamed on a public register. And sponsors who receive a maximum fine of £20,000 will have their license revoked. So if you are considering applying for a sponsor license or if you are an existing sponsor, it is equally important to ensure that your right to work checks are undertaken properly. So I'm going to move on. I have another very quick poll. Because I'm going to cover a couple of areas of right to work legislation. Um, and an area which I feel um, employers may not be aware of is that right to work checks were um, enhanced during the lockdown period. So my poll for now is just to try and establish how many people are affected by employing um, people during lockdown. So did you employ new staff over the lockdown period? It's simply yes or no. Thank you. Okay, so 64% um, of you uh, did employ new staff over the lockdown period, so I think I'm going to spend a few moments discussing, um, even though it's not Brexit related, discussing what um, measures are in place from the 30th of March. So for those of you who took on new staff, or for those who had visas expiring during um, the COVID temporary measures, which started on the 30th of March, and they are still um, current, and um, this process will apply to you. 
um, it's important that if it applies to you, that you check you have the recorded the information correctly. Now, once the measures end, there is a limit on repeating these checks in order for you to remain compliant with the right to work legislation and to avoid any penalties. So during the um, COVID lockdown or the measures, employers were permitted to undertake checks using video calls, using scanned documents or images, um, undertaking an online check or utilizing the employee checking service if that um, potential employee or existing employee didn't have any existing documents or current documents. So even though we were under lockdown, there was no exemption to undertake the checks. So for those of you who need to go back and check if the check, if your check, sorry, it's too many checks. Um, those of you who need to um, ensure that your check was conducted appropriately, I have five steps for you to consider. So you should have requested the copies of the original documents for that um, candidate or existing worker. By a video call, you should have viewed those original documents through the camera lens um, and then checking them against the documents you received by electronic means. On the document, you would record the date of the adjusted check, um, inserting the date and explaining that the check was undertaken under the COVID measures. If you were doing an online right to work check, you would look for the biometric residence card or electronic status. And if, you're, if you didn't have any documents, you during the video call, you would um, undertake a check online to the ECS checking service, and you would have to request permission from the candidate in order to do this check. Now, it's important if you've got to stage five, you didn't have any documents, that you wait before you offer employment. And doing this retrospectively might be rather difficult, um, but you obtain a positive verification notice from the ECS. Um, if you obtained a negative verification notice, then it would give you instruction and tell you, you you couldn't employ that person. And hopefully you'd have followed the instruction. So you need to have a look back now and make a note in those employees that were taken on, taken on during the lockdown period or those who had a time limited visa during the lockdown period, ensure you have this check carried out appropriately. Now, in addition to the revised check, there are also retrospective checks which need to be conducted. So employers who follow the COVID check in steps one to five in my previous slide must then make a note to carry, repeat these checks um, on any employees who started during the measures or any of those who required a follow-up check during the measures. Um, you must mark this retrospective check, the individual's contract commenced on, on on the date the prescribed right to work was checked was undertaken on the insert date due to COVID. Now these checks must be carried out within eight weeks of the measures ending and both checks must be kept on file. Now it's important that you have both of these checks on file should the Home Office ever want to inspect any documents um, from you either at a visit or um, a, a spot check. Um, now I mentioned at the start that these measures haven't ended yet we have an announcement that the measures for sponsors, so the temporary measures in place for sponsors will end on the 30th of September. However, given that we are, um, we are eminently to receive a potential um, temporary or partial lockdown, um, I don't know if um, this would be extended somewhat. But I would recommend that you put a note in your new employees or follow-up employees calendars to say that a retrospective check must be carried out within eight weeks of you conducting the first check so that you don't miss out and um, you, you remain compliant with the right to work legislation. So the right to work checks will change um, from January 2021 20, because European nationals will become a third national and require um, status um, 
to work in the UK. So for now, employers can accept ID documents and passports for European nationals up to the 30th of June 2021. Employers cannot ask European nationals to have their status or demand that they register for a status until the 1st of July, when you will then fall into the um, category of demanding a right to work as with any migrant who is a non-EEA or non-EU national. So we cannot ask for um, evidence of status, but you can accept IDs and passports up to the end of June. Um, employers can conduct electronic checks um, only if an employee has uh, shared their code with you. Um, as I said, you cannot demand evidence of registration, but employers now need to ensure that they have recorded in, in their diary that they need to chase all European national employees um, to provide their right to work status from the 1st of July 2021. Now, there is going to be a grey area from the 1st of January to the 30th of July, because obviously we could still have European nationals entering the UK who may not have the right to work. Um, they could come as a visitor and start looking for employment. So we don't want employers to fall into the trap of offering a role when that migrant, excuse me, when that European national potentially wouldn't have the right to work. So we do expect that the Home Office will provide us with some guidance. Um, as to what employers can do during that period of the 1st of January to the 30th of June. But what I would recommend is, if you are considering employing European nationals from the 1st of January, that during your discussion, you perhaps ask when they enter to the UK. And this could then potentially trigger alarm bells to say, well, perhaps they need sponsorship under a license. Um, perhaps they are here as visitors and not eligible to work and that um, you could ward off offering employment um, and then um, potentially get into um, uh, non-compliance issues later on down the road. So we will share that uh, guidance when it becomes available, um, we hope at the end of this year, if not early into next year. Now, before I move on to the final topic, we have another poll. And this is um, to have a guess as to how many free trade agreements the UK have already secured with the, with the Brexit negotiations. Is it none, 109, 19, one, or what's a free trade agreement? Oh, that's interesting. Well, we have 31% saying none, 8% uh, saying 109, 33% saying 19, um, 22 at one and 6% at what's a free trade agreement. Well, I, I'm happy to say that we have 19 um, free trade agreements. Um, I will share the information um, about this in a couple of slides. Um, firstly, I just want to have a, a, a go through the slide about a better future relationship. Um, so currently, um, you, you'll be aware of what's happening um, with, with our Brexit negotiations. Um, I think it's in the news daily and the press. Um, it is looking a little uncertain at the moment. And unless there are some dramatic concessions made from either side, um, we may be looking at exiting the European Union uh, without a deal. And now, if we exit without a deal, we will move automatically to a World Trade uh, Organization agreement. Um, this we had in place uh, before we joined the union in the early 70s. Um, the World Trade Organization is a body organization with 164 members and the UK is already a member. Um, the members agree tariffs and quotas. Um, all members receive um, the same um, agreements. There are no special concessions whether you form a relationship with it with a separate um, entity um, unless there's a free trade agreement and it means that the UK must negotiate with countries individually in order to obtain that free trade agreement. 
So let's look at who uh, the UK have established trade agreements with. Well, we have 19 continuity deals, which means that from the 1st of January, that we automatically um, move to agreements that have already been agreed with. I've mentioned some of them. So we have Switzerland, Norway, Iceland, Central America, South Korea, South Africa, and the Caribbean, to name but a few. Um, we also have Japan in progress and 18 other engagements ongoing. And again, to name a few, Canada, Mexico, Singapore, and Turkey. Um, in, we also have uh, mutual uh, recognition agreements, which is, um, it's 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 to it's confirming processes um, whether products meet specific legal requirements so it's not quite a free trade agreement but there are some recognition mutual agreements in place and these are with australia new zealand and the us so there is still a lot of work to do um, with very little time left so let's see what happens um, in the coming weeks um, with the negotiations uh, to see where we are um, so whilst we don't have a um, a crystal bowl. Um, I do have um, some preparation aspects um, which businesses can be undertaking ahead of uh, leaving without a deal. Um, I also will share with you um, after the slide a number of very specific uh, sector um, or area preparations which my colleagues in FSP have shared with me. I've obviously given you the immigration side but my colleagues from commercial corporate um, and uh, employment have shared some key points that I will run through quickly towards the end of the presentation. So in terms of business preparation, um, if you haven't done so already, the Home Office have a, have a really, really good website under .gov called Transition. If you register under Transition, you will receive regular updates. Um, it will also establish what your business needs with some um, key aspects of, of where you need to go for registrations. Um, so if you sign up there, um, you can assess what your what your business will require under your sector. Um, you need to assess uh, your EU national employees, the types of skill levels, the types of roles they have, and whether you will need to uh, register as a sponsor if you want to continue to employ European nationals from next year. If you're an employer and you send um, your employees to Europe, you need to consider whether um, the country you will send that employee has specific country requirements. You need to check that their qualifications um, will be recognized in the country where you want to send them. Um, there may be factors under social security contributions that would be affected in the destination country. And I would recommend that you talk to HMRC on this. Um, there may also be documents that those employees would need to carry with them if they're carrying goods for business. And if you are going to be transporting goods, um, you need to look at obtaining an EORI number and finding a customs agent. Now, the specific areas or sectors of business preparation, again, my colleagues have shared some of these key changes with me. Um, so if you do have any further questions on this, I will be happy to, to send these questions their way for a response. So in terms of employment, um, in the UK, there's no substantive changes expected. Um, however, if you operate any European works councils, you need to uh, seek advice then on the terms of this arrangement um, to see if it um, will work moving forward. Um, for employers who send employees into Europe, um, there is something called an ICT card, which may be um, useful for um, third countries uh, for visa purposes, which the UK will be from the 1st of January. I know it's very popular in Germany and it allows you to move um, employees uh, across Europe um, in the absence of not being able to have a Schengen or some other type of visa. Um, those uh, who have employees on the A1 under the poster, posted worker directive would need to review the terms, particularly those that span um, past the 1st of uh, January 2021, as we know that the A1 um, will no longer be in place from the 1st of January. And you need to look at if there's any social security implication, implications for those who are perhaps working in, in two countries. The next area my, my colleague Catherine will be able to assist you with is uh, commercial contracts. Um, you need to establish the governing law. Obviously, you continue to use English law for contracts. Um, consider forms for dispute, whether arbitration is affected. 
consider the references contained within your contracts, whether any definitions need to change. If you are going to be transporting goods, consider INCO terms and um, ensure that um, where you refer to EU law, it's equivalent to, to UK law for compliance. I'll move very swiftly through these areas. I'm conscious of time. Um, in terms of data protection, um, obviously the, our data, the GDPR has been um, established into UK legislation, so it will continue to comply. But obviously you need to analyze data flows between the, e, the UK and the EU. Um, intellectual property, there's no real changes in terms of trademarks, patents or copyright, but you need to consider dual filings for UK trademarks. Consider the definitions in your existing licenses and agreements and consider whether ongoing disputes can be um, involved um, and if they need to be reviewed. In terms of product regulation, there's some um, under EU law, there's some um, quite heavily regulated products in the UK. So you need to consider your supply chains, um, whether you need to assign new representatives, whether they're auth authorized to, to carry these goods. Um, marking, markings and labelling of products and that are placed in the UK market, chemical registrations and pharmaceuticals in particular, you need to engage with um, the regul regulatory body in the UK um, to ensure that um, you won't have any delays if you want to move goods um, from the 1st of January. Uh, export controls, it's all about licensing, ensuring you meet the requirements, um, checking whether items are controlled, um, checking whether you need to establish entities in each individual EU state if you want to continue to trade there or move goods there. Um, next focal area is customs. I mean, this will affect us all, um, but businesses who are moving um, goods, you need to, again, understand your supply chains where your goods are moved and manufactured. Consider uh, the financial impact if you need to, um, if additional duties need to be imposed um, on goods, you need to consider this um, on pricing. Again, INCO terms I've mentioned earlier, who will be your importers, whether you need to move goods now ahead of Brexit, um, you need to scale up your customs team or instruct some additional expertise. Um, financial services, um, those of you really just monitor announcements from your relevant authorities. For other services, you need to ensure that if, when, if and when we move to WTO, WTO rules, um, is there an agreement on trade and services that um, restrict provision of services in any of those states? And check local laws to ensure um, the service providers have a uh, legal presence in the EU member states. Um, competition law, um, it'll essentially remain the same, but have a look into enforcement, um, look at your practices, consider dual filings again as with other areas. And finally, on tax, um, VAT um, will be imposed once we, we leave Europe. So obviously this will affect uh, supply chain. Um, import and export procedures, again, accounting for VAT and duties. Many organizations will need to update their processes, um, consider pricing, um, consider cross-border services and some direct tax. So I've covered that very, very quickly, my apologies. Um, but if there is any aspect of those um, specific sectors or business areas that do affect you, um, please do get in touch and I will ask my colleagues to, um, to provide some more information on that. And my final slide is to look at what individuals need to be doing to prepare because ultimately um, the UK uh, leaving the European Union is going to affect um, most of us as individuals. Um, simply popping across to Spain or France to, you know, um, importing that um, nice red wine or French cheese. Um, so us individuals need to be um, looking at how we can prepare also. So as with businesses, I would recommend that individuals sign up for the um, transition newsletter. Um, the, the, the link to the newsletter is there on the slide. Um, you need to check your passport. I indicated earlier that traveling on a passport, you can only have a passport for a maximum of 10 years. So check the expiry date to ensure it's valid at the time of your travel. You need to look at your travel insurance, ensuring you're covered for travel into Europe. Um, check you have the right driving documents if you want to drive. Organize pet travel. It can take months um, to obtain a pet passport. Um, look to see whether you require a visa for business travel. Um, if you're carrying a mobile phone with you, you may be charged for roaming. 
um, in terms of entering on customs, you may have, you do have to declare cash um, over ten thousand pounds for arriving in the EU. Um, you may have to declare certain goods on entry for business for sale. Um, you will need to um, place um, custom declarations on posting items into the UK, and you will expect to pay customs duties and VAT on goods coming in. So those luxuries from France or Switzerland, you can expect to pay a little bit more in the future. I'm sorry I covered that very, very quickly, but I'm very conscious of time, and I had dedicated 15 minutes for questions and answers. So I am now moving into the questions and answer session where, as I said, I will in answer as many as I can in the timelines. Right, let me have a look and see how many questions we have. Right, I'm just going to take a few moments to read through some of your questions. Right, I have a question here in relation to asking for evidence for from a, um, a European national of their um, status under the EUSS scheme. Um, um, this is from Sarah. Um, well, Sarah, the um, Home Office have said that, um, and, in, and I, I believe it's also an agreement with the um, European negotiations, that if we are to ask or demand to see a status um, from a European national, we would be discriminating against them. So um, employers, there is an extension of time for European nationals to be able to use their ID card and passport up till the 30th of June. So until that time, um, employers must not ask or demand that their employees or future employees register under the USS scheme. I'm just looking through. I hope that's answered your question, Sarah. Right, I'm just looking through. Sorry, now I'm just reading these questions quickly. So we have a question in relation to employees who are working in a UK subsidiary in Germany. They are employees and pay their taxes to the German authorities. Are we as a UK employer, do we need to do anything with these employees or are they not included as they're based in Germany? So if your employees are German and working in Germany, um, then obviously um, there is no aspect of certainly right to work or um, sponsorship in the UK. Um, if they're paying, again, if they're also paying taxes um, to the German authorities, um, they would just simply be a worker in Germany working for a UK subsidiary. Um, now, if they are UK nationals working in Germany, um, they may be there currently under an A1 as a posted worker. Um, if they are, you need to consider the terms of that um, A1 um, contract and um, establish whether or not they will have, continue to have the right to work there past uh, the 1st of January, 2021. Well, 
I have another question here. Um, if we cannot ask European nationals for this status under the scheme until the 1st of July, at what point following the date are we in breach of the right to work legislation if they do not provide their evidence? What is the deadline by which they need to provide it? Well, you can request a current ID card or a passport for, from your European nationals up to the 30th of July. However, on the 1st of July, you need to ensure, or you can send communication earlier, but on the 1st of July, 2021, you need to ensure that all of your European nationals have provided you with their status. Um, it's electronic, it can be done very, very quickly, um, but I would recommend that you are preparing communication um, to so that they have that information with you on the day. Um, if they are having any issues with the registration, as I said, you can refer to the toolkit um, and provide them with information um, as to how they register if they haven't already registered. Now, I know many, many employers have um, good relationships with their European nationals and they have volunteered their information. So um, if your European nationals have volunteered the information with their um, status under the EU SS scheme, you can undertake the check so that it's already done. Um, and the like, the, you're less likely to have to undertake that check if they stay in employment with you from the 1st of July. Um, right. So we have another question. What happens if a current worker has not obtained status and remains in the UK? If you're not asked, um, allowed to ask status, would you be at risk of a fine? Um, you are permitted to ask for an ID and a current passport um, up till the 30th of June. And if you have obtained that document and recorded as a right to work check, then you will not receive any fine up to that point. However, as I indicated in my earlier response, you need to ensure that you have communicated to those European nationals so that they provide you with their status under the scheme before the 1st of July or on the 1st of July um, so that you can update your records accordingly. Right, I have a question here. Some of our employees have brought in a letter from the Home Office confirming they have settled status. Is this enough evidence of this? Um, normally, if they've received settled status under the scheme, they will also have an electronic status. The letter is merely um, to inform them that the status has been processed. However, that employee should uh, share a code with you as an employer so that you can um, access their um, electronic status online and once you access that status online you take a screen print of their status and record it as a right to work check. I hope that's responded, great. Um, Okay, we have a question here on a sponsor license. Um, as a recruitment company, do we just need to ensure the end client has the relevant license if they're interested in an overseas candidate? Um, yes, um, I think if the um, sponsor or the the end employer is interested in recruiting from overseas yes they would need to obtain the sponsor license and and undertake all the appropriate checks uh, to ensure they're eligible to um, sponsor that migrant um, if just bear in mind that uh, sponsor license applications can take up to eight weeks to process and um, so if the employer doesn't want to delay in recruiting uh, these migrants they should really look at uh, making an application now for a sponsor license ahead of um, the 1st of January so that they will be in place. 
to employ the time. Well, I think we have just come to the end of our, our time. So a, a big thank you to those of you who have um, asked questions. Um, I think I've responded to most of them, but if there are those that I haven't responded to, I'll take a look later and come back to you. Um, so thank you again. Um, I will just set out my details um, on, on this slide. If you need any further information, my phone number is there. Um, my email. Um, I share information regularly on LinkedIn, so please follow me and you will receive any updates I post. Um, we also, I'd just also like to introduce um, um, our Brexit Spotlight. It's a dedicated uh, Brexit resource on our website where we share information regularly. Um, we have a regular spot for um, updates received daily from, excuse me, weekly from Parliament. So, um, Today in Parliament, the government will vote on an amendment to prevent ministers disapplying part of the, uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol um, without MP approval. So all this happening in Parliament this week um, will be posted on our weekly update together with information in relation to Brexit from all other parts of the firm. So the final point is, if I may ask you please to complete the very short questionnaire which was coming up next. Um, as it will help with our future planning and uh, topics. And I would like to say a big thank you for joining us all today. I hope you have a good day and a week ahead. Thank you very much. <laughs>